Here we go. All right. The Starving Artist is brought to you by Heavy Water Coffee. With a time-honored passion for the craft, Heavy Water is selecting unique single-origin beans from all around the world and roasting them in micro-batches to maintain the highest level of quality control. High in quality, small in quantity. Head over to heavywatercoffee.com. Use promo code Casey Ryan Music at checkout for 10% off your order. Again, that's heavywatercoffee.com. Promo code Casey Ryan Music at checkout for 10% off your order. The Starving Artist is also brought to you by Liquid IV. Liquid IV's mission is to help everywhere, people everywhere live better lives, optimize the body, hydrate those in need, and better the planet. From the electrolyte multiplier to the triple hydration single use packets, Liquid IV is becoming a staple in the hydration game and is an incredible product for anyone looking to expand their overall health and fitness. Visit liquid-iv.com. Use promo code Casey Ryan Music at checkout for 20% off. Again, that's liquid-iv.com. Promo code Casey Ryan Music at checkout for 20% off your order. Jay Casey, what the hell's up, man? How are you? Yay. Uh, I am wonderful. Thank you. It is uh, still snowing outside. So, yeah. Yeah, it's- Finally, the winter wonderland up here. Dude, and, yeah, uh, that's your old stomping grounds. Yeah, that's where. That's where. Yeah, it's fucking beautiful. Sixty-five degrees right now here. So, and that feels freezing to me. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's crazy, man. Uh, how, so how's it been, man? How are things? Uh, how are things going up there? How are you? Well, um, that's super loaded. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I feel like well, we both kind of went through the whole super fun self-employed artist to non-employed artist yeah and um, yeah yeah and how uh intimate details on how uh, impactful that is on relationships Mm -hmm. uh, romantic professional and otherwise yeah but yeah kind of bouncing back and pivoting recovering from that um i do tattoos full-time and Mm -hmm. i I coach part-time and the prices of gloves is um terrifying so that's that's the recent kind of dragon interesting yeah i didn't even think about that in terms of just how much you go through that tattooing Mm -hmm. yeah interesting yeah so so we straight up we do not answer the phones anymore uh really tattooing yeah and if somebody comes in they want like a gift certificate it's like well sit there you know and like wait for a while because i gotta get the most out of it and be really conscious about the use there because sometimes Mm -hmm. it's whether or not it's less about whether we can afford it and more so if they're just available, which is also scary. Yeah. This is a, I mean, obviously it's probably a discussion that people every day, everywhere are having to some, especially on podcasts to some extent, it's just about the current state of things and where it's headed. <laughs> and I don't know, I know there, there's a few questions I want to ask you related to kind of what you just talked about. Um, but before I do that, I guess we can talk about a little bit just for me, I feel like the last eight months, both both externally, internally, and everything in between has felt like years. I don't know if you can relate to that at all, but it's, it's felt, I felt so many intense emotions from the beginning of COVID to the end of it, whether it was, yeah, through like we both, I think we both went through a breakup. Um, We both, you know, went from feeling some semblance of security in our careers and feeling good about where we were to all of a sudden having that kind of flipped upside down. So I guess before I get into these questions, I mean, how, how have you kind of, I guess, how have you felt as though the last eight months have transformed you and, and how have you kind of implemented new strategies to, to embark on this new path and, and it, both within yourself and within your career? Awesome. Well, it's, it's just, you know, felt like a, basically like a constant ceremony. Mm-hmm. Um, the whole entire time and then it's been a lot of uh mirrors kind of popping up and that i'm i'm forced to look at things that um are difficult and uncomfortable and about like how i handle situations and how i deal with stress and what i'm able to do when things are taken away from me so adjusting through that is just trying to find the right balance between like when is it okay to kind of move inward and do work inward and when is it time to like drop the fucking hammer and party and get some work done yeah so the the biggest shift was trying to take like the leisure that i learned during my two-month vacation that i didn't want and i wasn't prepared for Mm -hmm. and um now that i'm able to i'm super fortunate to be able to be back to work so how do i apply that so i can 
be fully in my job and also not burn out. So I'm not trying to get back to where I was immediately, you know, trying to go, you know, taking things in, in a rate that is sustainable instead of just back straight into the fire. Yeah. And, um, yeah, just how I, how I feel myself, everything that goes into like my mouth or my ears or my eyes, trying to be conscious of that. So then I can do my job and, and be of service and, and do all those things. Yeah. So I guess I, we can kind of take apart that too. I mean, I, I kind of like, I don't know. I have questions asking. I'll get to them too, but I kind of like the idea of kind of just going off the cuff a little bit here. Cause, um, mm-hmm. you, you mentioned a couple things in there, especially about, um, when, about being patient with yourself and not just going like throwing yourself on the fire again. And especially you mentioned something that kind of caught my attention about, um, how you handle stressful situations and how you needed to revisit those things. That's, that's really crazy that you bring that up because I am just, as of the last few months when COVID first happened, you know, I, I, you and I, I think have been on kind of this, a similar journey as far as like the journey inward and, and figuring out who we are at our core and why we've been a certain way and why things have turned out a certain way, especially in like, for me, at least it's been, why has every single relationship I've had turned out the same way and putting it in the context of a mirror, like instead of, instead of focusing on like what the external did to you, understanding like why you did certain things and behaved in certain ways and, and, and acted in certain times when you were under certain amounts of stress yeah. or and put that, yourself in a, in a similar situation too. Yes. And, and, and like putting yourself in a similar situation then, and then for some reason having a naive or grandiose expectation that it would turn out differently. Um, mm-hmm. I've always, uh, I've always been the kind of person who I, and I don't know if you share this at all, but for me, it's like the feeling of not deserving or feeling like you, that you can't truly ask for what you really need out of somebody because you feel like if you do that, they won't be able to give it to you. And then do and then not being able to communicate in a way that's conducive to the betterment of the relationship, but it ultimately leads to the demise of it because you weren't vulnerable enough to be able to share it in the first place. And then kind of like what we don't have to get into it, but like kind of like what happened in your circumstance of like you did choose to be vulnerable and it still didn't work out. I mean, obviously, like I from what I understand, it's a civil situation still, but yeah, um, so. I mean, how, how, how much, I guess in in that sense, do you think that your value of, did you have to look at yourself through a different lens in order to get to that point? Or was it because of things turning out in a different way that wasn't favorable or was it a combination of both? It's definitely a a combo. Like, um, asking myself the questions like, why is it so fucking difficult to communicate Mm -hmm. (laughs) and why is it so difficult to um put feelings into english <laughs> yeah <laughs> just be like i feel this way You're like what's that feel like well it feels like a really dark purple storm and there's just lemons and razor blades everywhere You're like well that doesn't really help anybody understand how i'm feeling if i'm just trying to describe this picture so um in- increase trying to increase the language that i have about it so i could get mm-hmm. my point across how i how i feel and that's a big it's not like a, a phobia, but something that I, I worry about a lot is being misunderstood. So if I say something yes. and, it, and it lands in a way that I didn't want it to come across in, I'm just like, fuck. Dude, that's so, <laughs> like so yeah. much more work to do now to, to redo <clears throat> what I just did in a way that it would be like, um, like an architect drawing out these plans and then seeing the building built and being like, absolutely not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and that's, and I think that's what's so difficult too, is like, because I don't think that anybody ever intends on the, like, unless obviously maybe if, if it's anger driven or emotion driven in a sense, like I'm sure that sometimes things are said or, or land in a way that, that are meant to be hurtful. If you're trying to like win in a sense, if you're trying to win an argument or just like drop this fucking atomic bomb of language. But I think for the most part, especially you know, whether it's with a friend or just um, a person that you're in an intimate relationship with, I don't think it's ever the intention to hurt somebody by saying something. And, and if that is your intention, then you need to get the fuck out of that relationship anyways. Um, well, for me, it was like anything that happened past like 11.30 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's just like, I'm like, well, <laughs> please get me the fuck out of here. We can continue this another day. 
I yeah. Need to sleep. Yeah, yeah, but I also yeah, think so I'm super guilty of that. Yeah, well, and as am I. But I think I think that I don't know. Just to further that point, I think that it's much better to take a step back in situations when you feel yourself becoming emotional or the propensity for you to say something that could be hurtful. It's important in those moments to take a step back and say, let's revisit this later when I'm in a better place, yeah. you know, but I mean, but oftentimes like for me, that's a hard fucking thing to do because, um, I'm a fixer. That's kind of the kind of the person that, and, that, and that's a thing that I'm realizing about myself. That is obviously like something that I really need to not do is not take responsibility for how other people are feeling and just only take responsibility for how I'm feeling because in the past, especially in, in relationships or even in friendships, if I've had a conflict with somebody, like I always want to resolve it right there. Like I just, like we have to, we have to fix this now rather than having the peace of mind to take a step back and be mindful of the fact that like, we need to come to these realizations independent of each other and then meet in the middle. Mm -hmm. And you can state your intent you know, that's what my, my business used to be named before I, I dissolved it. And we could talk about that too. But mm-hmm. yeah, I think your intent is everything. So you can just be like, hey, this is this is where I'm at. I want to talk about this. If you don't, if it's a bad time, don't worry about it. But now you know. Mm-hmm. So now that I say it out loud, it kind of sounds like a like a relinquish of responsibility, which may or may not be a good thing, depending on how you look at it. Yeah. But um but yeah, it's just kind of like, hey, now the ball's in your court, and this is where I'm at. Now you know, and we could move forward. Yeah, and the, but, but I think yeah, just because people are so emotionally driven, it's it's next to impossible to understand. Like, especially if you are trying to communicate in a way that is um, empathetic and compassionate and loving, and the other person just isn't ready to hear that. It's it's next to impossible to know like fucking how to do that, but. Um, but yeah, I guess we, yeah, so I, I wanted, yeah, I guess I did want to touch a little bit about, you know, your businesses and, and, and what, and kind of your background, because what's weird is like you and I have actually known each other for like, I, I've known of you and like seen you mm-hmm. like for fucking like 10 years. I remember seeing you back, yeah. like, I remember back in the day when I first started working out at 360 Fitness in Coeur yeah. and like, yeah, <laughs> dude, it, and it, I love that gym. Like that was back in like fucking bodybuilding yeah. days and shit. But I remember, I remember even then. I never, I don't think I ever like properly introduced myself to you then, but I, I, I knew you and like, I saw you all the time. And even then you were repping, you were repping on it in like the early days mm-hmm. and like you were repping the fucking maces and the kettlebells and like back, I mean now as of the last few years, I love that style of exercise and I, I'm into that stuff. But I, I remember back then being like, not like in a judging way, but just being like, what the fuck is this guy? Doing? <laughs> you know, like, totally. but, but it yeah. was, it was cool. So I wanted to ask you about that. So, I mean, what kind of what led you to that unique perspective on exercise and fitness? And like, did it just some, is it kind of just something that you were always interested in or did you just kind of fall into it then or what? Um, I was, I was driven towards it by tattooing because I'm basically Interesting. like a macaroni or a fucking banana all day with like my head's in extension <laughs> and my shoulders are forward. And yeah, I'm, that makes like, sense. Yeah. I got to lead and stuff. And so I was in, I started my tattoo apprenticeship when I was like 19 or 20. Mm-hmm. It's kind of a gray area of starting it because I just weaseled my way in there. It was not like formal or anything. I just kind of showed up and then never left. Um, but yeah, I was like making dad noises in my fucking early 20s. You know, and <laughs> oh, I was like, God, like <laughs> and then like my body was starting to hurt. And I just, I had this kind of bitter taste in my, my mouth from like high school weightlifting. And I, like our coach wasn't very good. I wasn't very confident in a gym. And then I saw all this warrior shit that my buddy Shane told me about. Um, cause he was balls deep in the Joe Rogan podcast mm-hmm. and, uh, he, he let me know about on it and these maces. So, uh, so that led you to maces. Aubrey Marcus and yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Down the weird fucking path, man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I did fall in love with just like the, the power through rotation mm-hmm. is what's, kept me there so instead of just that front focused you know working all the muscles that you can see less worried about the muscles that you can't see in the kind of like more i mean lacking for a better term like like the bro lifts yeah you know? it's like i haven't, yeah. haven't bench pressed since like high school yeah i don't do like just focus curls you know there's like curling motions that i do but it's generally followed by some sort of rotation or something explosive and I just I really fell in love with that and I think that's what's going to translate into that real life three-dimensional monkey kind of health functional fitness yeah 
Yeah. Instead mm-hmm. of trying to be like the strongest motherfucker in a gym, which is dope. If you want to do that, that's great. Yeah. But like, I'm not your dude for that. Yeah. No, <laughs> dude. I, and, and that's, that's, it's really, I, I love that you said those things because back, even back in those days, I, I was that dude. I was the fucking bro yeah. lifter guy. And like, and I, and I like, I would, I didn't want to be a bodybuilder, but like I was lifting as if I wanted to be a bodybuilder. So I think that like once I realized there, there's a couple things, it's also like fitness for you subjectively, it's, it's all different for everybody. Um, but, but the same as you, I started to notice like lower back pain from fucking squatting and like, um, just being like taking so many days to recover from just like fucking my body up because essentially it's all you're doing in a gym is you're tearing down muscle and it's up to like but yeah. you can tear down muscle in a much productive, more productive way, which is why I drifted toward as of the last like three or four years, like calisthenics based and kettlebell training mm-hmm. because I, I had this, I had this, I had this insecurity and this fear that like, Oh, I'm going to lose size. And like, I'm not going to be as big. And like, I won't like, you know, just these, these silly notions. And then like, once I started like a ketogenic type of diet of like, I'm not eating carbs, I'm going to look soft and weak. And then like, and then intermittent fasting, if I don't, what do you mean? I have to eat every two hours. What are you talking about? But then like once, so I started these things like three or four years ago on this path. And like, I'm never going back to that dude, because it's interesting because you put you put kettlebells in people's hands or or like you think that you know you think that like a turkish get up it's it looks easy like when somebody mm-hmm. does it that's a master of it but when you try to do it even with like a 35 pound dumbbell for the first time you're like this is fucking hard <laughs> so yeah, like, like kind of like 16 different steps yeah to take to yeah get to that you so kind of like the invisible work yeah exactly the and then that's a great way to put it like the working the muscles that like the slow twitch, the shoulder pack strength, you know, your core strength is a big one. I remember when I first started calisthenics, like doing L sits and I couldn't even like hold my legs up for like 10 seconds, but I had a six pack, but like, Mm -hmm. but my internal, yeah. So the invisible thing anyways, but as a whole, I just thought it was really, it was, it was interesting that you took that unique approach at such, you know, so early on and it's obviously carried with you now because so, so this, the, the, you got you did you get certified through on it or did you yeah so i did yeah. two certifications i did their foundations course which is basically like a little bit of everything mm-hmm. and then i the following year with my former business partner we did the uh durability cert so it's like mobility and de- decompression so i don't particularly enjoy the term like warm up because like i've seen people warm up where they just get dressed and then they'll like stand in the sauna like when i was in peak and yeah. then they'd go and like hit their sets. And I'm like, just because you're fucking warm doesn't mean <laughs> that like your body's prepared. I'm warm. You know, then, My body feels yeah. warm. Yeah. And yeah. then the whole cool down aspect, like when I'm decompressing, I'll generally sweat more during that than I will a workout aside from like rowing or battle ropes or like long flows with any sort mm-hmm. of implement that I'm using. So yeah, my cool down, I'm fucking dripping by the end of it. So, uh, but yeah, this were, the second cert is where we learned all that. And um, the rest of my certs are through Living.Fit, mm-hmm. which is a company that is under Kettlebell Kings. Okay. And uh, Kettlebell Kings are awesome. Uh, some fun info about kettlebells since you like them. Competition bells are all the same size and the same shape. Mm-hmm. And they're color-coded, so you could tell what kind of kilograms they are uh, by the color. But the, with Kettlebell Kings, it's the internal wall thickness of the bell that determines the weight instead of them being filled with like shot and sawdust. Interesting. Like they okay. Act over time. So yeah, their bells are the tits. Super great. I love their stuff. And, and it's uh, measured, it's, it's measured like in poods, right? Um, that is, where did the pood come from? That's, it was Russia. So I, it was like, it was that, that yeah. Pavel Sasuin. Is that his name? Mm-hmm. Was it, was that? Yeah. yeah okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I don't know the poods very well. I could more or less figure out, like, kilograms and pounds in my head pretty quick. Yeah. Until you start getting into, like, big Olympic lift numbers. Yeah, and, and then, then you're like, got, uh, I gotta get my phone <laughs> like well, yeah, how much is that? Yeah, for sure. And then you're like, yeah, like, 250 kilograms is, like, over 500 pounds. You're just like, what? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, so so I'm so I'm curious about, the, curious about this, too, because I think it's a good segue into it. Because, um, you know, you mentioned, like, you mentioned you kind of touched on it before about how like you were always interested in the idea of like rotation and movement. And and that's something that, you know, I got into yoga about eight or nine years ago at this point now. And, um, 
I, I was, I, when I first like started to fall in love with yoga and the practice of it, um, was that something that you like, obviously I'm sure that you had, you have a, a yoga practice of some sort and a meditative practice of some sort. So mm-hmm. what, what kind of did the, did the kettlebell idea of movement and, and rotation and just like feeling the flow of your body, did that, did that inspire you to get involved with yoga or was it just independent of that on your own? So, um, so like a, a little bit of both. Um, it was mostly like, like the impact that I was doing to my body and then how can I like fix that, that contrast of all that, that pressure, you know, bearing down on my body, doing like the swings and the, um, explosive like snatches and get ups and, and all of that stuff. Mm-hmm. But like, I want to do that for a long ass time. So how do I do that? That's what drove me to the durability cert, which borrows a lot from yoga. They use a lot of the same moves. And then um, the intention is a little bit different and just like a little tiny thing. So it's more about like your, your fascia and that whole mm-hmm. system, yep. less about your chakras. Not saying that like chakras aren't important. That just wasn't where my education was at. Plus that so gets I I, do like the 300 yeah. hour yoga teacher training. You know, yeah, which, which when, and I actually, I did a 500 hour and like when I went, when I went through it, yeah, like (laughs) the problem with like putting things in terms of chakras and like fascia tissue makes sense because it's scientific and like, we know that like there's emotion held in fascia tissue and, Mm -hmm. and the release of it and the catharsis of it through yoga or, Mm -hmm. or movement exercise is profound. The research on it's great. But when you start getting into like chakras and opening your root chakra or your ajna and like you know people that i think that's where you lose people a little bit you mm-hmm. know but and that's and that's kind of what turns a lot of people away from yoga that have never done it you know so yeah for sure but i think it's just like if that's what's stopping you from doing something then like get the fuck over it yeah and maybe just see what it's about like people have been talking about this shit for literally like thousands of years so you can mm. peel away the mysticism yourself, just like, you know, get hop in your the mystery machine and drive down to a fucking yoga studio and see, you know, what's going on there. Where do you, yeah? So, well, I mean, I guess we can talk about that too a little bit. I mean, where where does where do you think the fear of people's like? Because I've I've tried to dissect this and I think that I've I've reached my own conclusions, but I'm curious to see what you think about it. Is like where do you think people's fear of diving inward? comes from like do you think that it's because it's the path of least resistance is just blaming the external or not taking responsibility and not owning up to what owning up to what you've done and mistakes you've made and like maybe being haunted by guilt and shame and trauma and all the things that coagulate into this fucked up person that you are but like why do you think that people why do you think that people choose to not look inward and look externally for the because it's comfortable to not do that. It's fucking mm. hard and it's terrifying and it's generally yeah. covered in blood and shit and tears. And you're just like, mm-hmm. why do, why do I do this? And that'd be like a good segue into like a conversation about psychedelics is because like when people say they have a bad trip, which I also just viciously disagree with that language as well. Mm. But like when they're like, Oh, I had a bad trip. Like, Oh, did you have to look at something you didn't like? Did yeah. You get your fucking feelings Dude. hurt. Like yeah. stick your fingers in there and rip that shit apart and see what's underneath it instead of like being like, Oh, it was bad. Yeah. Well, and, and, and that's the thing too, is like when, and it just, if we're going to talk about this for a sec, I mean, like I've had one bad trip or whatever, but it was simultaneously the worst experience and the best experience of my life. I mean, and I, I think about, I literally think about it every single day for one thing. My set and setting was wrong. I mean, my setting was right. The set in my mindset probably wasn't the best because it was, it was like my third weekend in a row doing mushrooms and I was going through a breakup, a different breakup because that's what I fucking do. Um, but, you know, I remember in those moments, like literally I was looking at my body and I just looked like this like worm. I looked like the men in black worms. And I just nice. remember just feeling such a, like a deep sense of like hatred for myself. Like, and it, but it wasn't like, that I hated myself. It was that I hated a certain element about myself that I hadn't, that I hadn't looked at with a microscope. And that's what psychedelics do and allow you to do. But people don't exactly what you just said. Like it's not comfortable to do that. But when that experience was over, I felt the most profound sense of gratitude for, for having gone through it. And like, not only that, because it was also over, (laughs) but like a lot of value there. (laughs) Yeah. But, um, But. but yeah, like that's, that's the beautiful thing about, yoga and getting in touch with your body or breath work or the fucking cold plunges mm-hmm. that you do, you know, like that, oh, yeah, that's you know, 
Oh, it's yeah, it's it's miserable. But like when it's done, like even when even when it's happening, like I think that what I what I love about you and like what we I think we share is like that desire to suffer physically or mentally th- to get the reward on the other side. And I think that people have a different view of that, and they they want to put a band aid on the pain. They they want to drink yeah. or get. And by the way, that's there's nothing wrong with those things. But if you use it solely as a method of advancing a way to get over your pain, it's not getting over your pain. It's putting a bandaid on your pain and just pushing it further away from you. Well, nobody has a problem like trading years of their life for money. But if I want to trade like minutes of discomfort for like a lasting effect, you know, for the rest of the fucking week by like hopping in the lake in North Idaho every Sunday. Yeah. And it's like, then all of a sudden I'm weird. You know, but it's yeah. like, no, you'll fucking kill yourself with some dead end job so you could buy shit to impress your friends that don't give a fuck. Yeah. You know, it's just, and like, that's, yeah. it's just the trade off, yeah. you know, it's like, yeah. And like you and I, we kind of know like the value of like, Hey, working out sucks. Doing psychedelic. Nope. Yeah, Cause I'm during breath. So I don't want to look at. And, um, yeah, it's just, it's just a trade, you know, do yeah. that stuff, get cool things. It's like a video game. Yeah, absolutely. And, and dude, that's such a good point about, and, and it's crazy because you think about that. I mean, I've, I've definitely worked jobs that I didn't like before, just strictly for money. And then like, you know, obviously once I was able to do music full time, that was, that was the, the fruit of my hard labor, like pushing through all the shit that I fucking went through to get to that point. Um, and then obviously COVID has rearranged everything for that. I mean, and I'm, I, we don't even have to get into that. I'm just saying like the, the point of, I think of life is, for one thing, all of the religious people for thousands of years, just like you said, have said the same things that like life is suffering. They've all just said it in a different way, whether it's Buddha or Jesus Christ or Hindu or whatever it is, whatever religion, life is suffering. And then there's a path to reduce that suffering. And that's the best way forward is to try and reduce suffering as much as you can and be of service to others. That's a fucking beautiful premise. But in order to get to the point where you can be of service to others, you have to give to yourself first. You have to give yourself the space, time, time and pain and go through the suffering to understand your shortcomings and what your and the the your your propensity to sin your propensity to be a shitty person your propensity to to hurt people and by the way it's not a fuck it's not like you ever arrive at that point i mean jesus christ for the past fucking 10 years i have made countless mistakes and i've hurt people and i've done a lot of shit that i haven't done but i've went through the suffering and the pain introspectively to to try and at least have some semblance of an understanding of why I did those things. Um, yeah. But I also think so you don't have to repeat that. Exactly. But like it all comes yeah. down to intention too. And I think that like what I've struggled with sometimes is not, not the act of doing the thing that I know is good for me, but like the intention behind it is like actually being mindful of the intention behind it. Like when I'm about to hop in the lake or, or meditate, like what am I getting out of this? And like, what do I want to accomplish out of it? And those are the hard questions to ask yourself because sometimes you don't know. So Yes, it's that's and that's the the scary part too. Like what we were saying earlier, like what keeps people from wanting to do stuff like that is like you have no idea what's gonna happen and what's gonna pop up. You know, there's like a couple months ago, I was doing like a meditation and breath work at the gym after my workout, and um, I was like, oh fuck, I'm gonna start crying. I'm gonna start crying right now. So I dipped. Ah, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just hit the jeep and and got home and then. Uh, finish the breathwork practice and a bunch of stuff came up and I was just like cool not how I wanted to spend my Thursday evening but that shit happened but here I am (laughs) right here I am just like yeah I it's weird for me too because I remember I will not remember but also like I'm cognizant of the fact that like sometimes when I need to have that kind of cry that kind of that sort of catharsis Mm -hmm. where you just like fucking (laughs) like it 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 (laughs) I said, I think I spend so much for me. Like, I think that maybe I don't know, call it a shortcoming or maybe just call it my, I'm just fucked up anyway. But like, um, for me, when I have those states in mind, when I do get emotional after a meditation or a yoga, especially yoga, it happens quite often. Um, it, it brings me to my knees sometimes just like, just that, that overwhelming sense of emotion that like you get from looking inward sometimes and because it's because like it's not necessarily a sad cry it's more of just like a relinquishing of like repression of things that you've kept inside um and for some reason society deems it as like if you're a man you shouldn't do that 
you know, and, I hate um, that shit, man. yeah. Or, and, and then on the other side, like, I think a part of like the hyper progressive society that is causing a detriment. And again, I'm not a woman, so I can't speak to this, but like, it's, it's almost like I, I, I obviously want, I, I want every woman to feel respected and empowered. Um, but I think it, it comes to the point of like, people are just wanting to receive first before they give now. And then that's happening to both male and females like that, like in order to, in order to get what you want, you have to just be this like selfish, like, Oh, I'm a queen or like I'm a king. And like that operating in those shadow mentalities of like, I deserve, I'm entitled, give me first is never going to give you what you need. I think, uh, because language is important. I'm kind of like the, the not the grammar Nazi as much, but like the language Nazi. I think the king and queen archetype is like the the person that doesn't look away. Mm-hmm. Um, but the princess and the prince archetype, I think you could go straight to like the, you know, what comes to mind when I say princess, you know, is that girl that wants everything handed to her. But like a queen is, you know, maybe she's got the dress on, but she's also got plate steel on and she's doing some work. She's there. She's there leading alongside. Yeah, exactly. But then the prince is the one that's like coercing and and taking everything that he wants and not doing the work and is up on the ramparts yelling down at his men to do the damn work Mm -hmm. where the king is on the horse in the vanguard moving forward. Yeah. With that, you know, and it's, I think it just comes down to looking away and looking at it. Yeah. That's a, yeah, that's, that's a beautiful way to conceptualize it, man. Looking away or looking at it instead of looking away. And, um, and I think that probably the, I would argue one of the biggest things that has been pushing people to look away is just a complete inability to properly communicate with one another. And, and, and like that, that goes back to what we were talking about before about just not knowing how people like don't, we're not really taught, we're, we're taught to, we're taught in our school system to, to learn about math and science and like all this, all this arbitrary knowledge that for some reason, a group of people decided that we needed to know, but we're never properly taught how to conceptualize what we feel like we need or what we feel like we value or, or how we feel. And when you reach a point in, in, in early adulthood or your young life, when the, those things start to like confuse you out of confusion breeds the perpetual expectation of people to meet your need that you don't even know that you need. So you put an expectation on people and when they don't meet that, you blame them or you blame, you blame your job. But it like the, but the ability to look inward is completely pushed aside, cast aside out of the path of of least resistance, which is, Oh, I'm just going to go fuck another girl or I'll just go fuck another guy. Or I'll just say, Oh, I, you know, he didn't give me what he wanted. He was crazy or she was a psychopath. It's like, no dude, what did you do? Or for the girl, like, what did you do to push him away? Mm-hmm. But people don't want to think about that. Yeah. No. yeah. Well, it's, it's really difficult to look at yourself and be like, oh, I was the villain. Yeah. <laughs> like hero and villain or, or like king and prince or queen and princess. We're all, all of those things moment to moment. It's like, you don't get to live there. Like rent is due every single second. Mm-hmm. So it's just like, it, it fucking sucks, you know, looking at that and be like, oof, really shit the bed on that one. Oh, man. You know, it's like everyone's like, oh, no, that's just how I make my bed. I definitely take a shit right in the middle of it on the sheets. I meant to do that. And they could double down on that instead of being like, oh, mm-hmm. no, I fucked up. Yeah. Do you think that – do you think that part of – mastering your emotions and and mastering yourself. I mean, if that's even a possibility, I mean, obviously I think that it's kind of your life's work. Yeah, exactly. It's, but I mean, it's probably like, you know, at least for people like you and I maybe, and I would, I would collectively say a lot of other people who are interested in these kind of things too. Um, part of self mastery is complete ownership, you know, and uh, of, of like your current circumstances, both for the good of the, for, for the, whether for, for better, for worse, like you ended up where you are because of decisions you made. Um, so I guess in situations where you've experienced the propensity to want to blame somebody else for how something turned out or blame circumstances for how things turned out, how, how are you able to kind of stop in the moment and mitigate that and, 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 and drive it more toward a place of, okay, well, these things happened, but, but I am responsible for my response to it. So how, how have you been able to do that? Um, and I think it all comes to like who's driving and the answer is always the same as I'm driving. And then, so I, I have control over that. 
because mm-hmm. I, I fucking do. It's my responsibility. And then I heard it super well put. Uh, his name's Matt Vincent. It was on his podcast. And he said, he was telling the story, like, if I lend... To my Jeep, and fall, give you the keys. Also, like, if I borrow your car and I wreck it, that's also my fault. Mm-hmm. So it's that kind of like same, like just that radical amount of just like responsibility to be like, nope, if this happens, I deal with it. It falls onto me. I think if everybody did that and just had that kind of collective cycle of like responsibility, then it would just smooth out a whole lot of things. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that that's just. I also think that because we don't have any we because we don't have any tools for doing this and we're not to we're not really taught to do this and i think that especially now what society values is that deflection of responsibility um sure. whether it's like you know i especially see it with the young, younger people i mean i mean how you're you're like 30 right uh, 29 yeah I'll be 29 30 in february. oh well, i'm 31 so i'm fucking in my 30s now but um, yeah. i think yeah. like for people that you know just around like the 21 to 23 ish you know, that's typically like where you see it. It's like you have, you have females now literally physically altering their bodies out of some notion as if they feel like they're not attractive enough or beautiful enough or, or they're inadequate in some way to have to feel like they have to alter themselves to, I'm not necessarily saying in every circumstance it's to be appealing to the opposite sex, but I think that that's what society is programming them to believe. Um, and then you have the males on the other side who aren't successful but want to seem as though they're successful by renting a Lamborghini and posting it on Instagram and like so it's this is constant disconnect from each other and this like, constant disconnect from our biology and our hormones and our way of communication so I'm curious like I mean where do, where do you see this going I mean do you see do you see like a spiritual awakening of some sort happening or and like people figuring out that this the way that we're currently doing things and where we're going isn't fucking working or do you think it's going to get worse before it gets better um oh man there's so much where do i start uh like who's like what what we're saying about uh traditional education in, in school they teach you all these things to get you a better life but they don't actually teach you about life so it's it's the safe to assume that the school's assumption is that somebody else is going to teach you that mm-hmm. i think having olders instead of having elders is is the main issue. I'm older than you, like you're older than I am. So you're superior because of your age that's older instead of like an elder where it's like the that grandma or grandpa that can still laugh and still has fun, like the grandpa that's still playing tricks and doing these fun things and listening and growing still versus somebody that's like, I fucking hate this. Everything's changing. I remember back in the day mm. when there was prairies all over this place. Now there's subdivisions. And fuck this and fuck that. Interesting. Okay. As yeah. Like, as like an older. So I think that is a is a big issue because it's like what like we don't have a lot of people to look up to in that aspect to be like, oh, this is what a well-adjusted emotional man looks like, or this is you know a fucking queen to look up to instead of a princess. You know, Interesting. It's like, That's a good point. You have you have the king, you have the castle, you have all the armies. Doesn't mean you're in that queen archetype or that king archetype. Yeah. And then, um, like you said, where is it going to go from there? Is um, I don't know, I've like I've never talked to a caterpillar before, but I have to assume that the transformation is hellish and horrible and probably very fucking difficult to turn into a butterfly. Mm-hmm. I think. I've tried to talk horrible. to them. On psychedelics. Yeah, Hello. I've been that. I've been that high too. <laughs> but yeah. um. But yeah, I think it just comes down to that. Like, who who are you looking up to? You know, what are you using these social media tools to feed yourself with? Is it like, are you following fucking Cardi B? Just bought a Lambo for her fucking boyfriend or something? Or are you following some dude that talks about his you know trip reports or um, people that are ending or fighting child trafficking and all of like the real life heroes out there versus other celebrities that are just kind of flaunting yeah wealth and this like unattainable kind of thing you know just to everyone's like oh man i want to be like that they're like why wouldn't you want to be the best that it is of what you do and what makes you happy that's such a good point like cardi b you know that's such a good point and yeah like people always want to be the next so-and-so instead of being Mm -hmm. the first version of them 
you know, or like yeah. the version of them that like, I think that's it, man. I think you nailed it. Like the, I love, I love the analogy of, you know, transferring for, or transforming from a butter or from a caterpillar into a butterfly. That process is painful. But like, I think that so many people are just comfortable and satisfied with the caterpillar, cal- caterpillar mentality, because that's what's, mm-hmm. it's almost like, it's almost as if, it's almost as if mediocrity is, is the goal. Now, it, like mediocrity is, you know, well, success is the goal and being a prominent figure is the goal and like being successful is the goal, but mediocrity is what's accepted. And mm-hmm. it's almost, it's almost cool now and gen- and collectively accepted now to not care as much as you should, you know, because that's why I, that's why I admire people like you so much or just, just any, like people, pretty much everybody that I really try to have some sort of communication with openly and vulnerably with is because like, I want to surround myself with people who, who want to be better and not, aren't just satisfied with like this mentality of, Oh, you're perfect the way you are. Like never change. It's like, no, because that's the whole point of life is to change and constantly evolve. Constant death, constant rebirth. Like yeah. you kill a version of yourself. Just change in the one word. Like you're, you're perfect. Like the way you are, you can say you're perfect where you are. Doesn't mean you have to stay there. But where you are is perfect and you need to be there. You don't need to fucking stay there. Yeah. That's that's beautiful, man. Um, that's beautiful, dude. Let me read an ad real quick and then I'll ask you a quick yeah, another on. quick question. So uh, let me see here. Pull up the old... This is a great conversation, man. I appreciate you again, dude. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. This is fucking fun. Yeah. Uh, the Starving Artist is brought to you by Breed Love Guitars, the hallmark and mission to create perfect acoustic sound. To match that sound with effortless playability and to craft a clean, modern, aesthetic instrument, head over to breedlovemusic.com to check out their entire collection of a vast array of acoustic and acoustic electric instruments. Breed Love Guitars, play better, sound better. The Starving Artist is also brought to you by Flight Sports Supplements. At Flight, we are passionate about two things, faith and fitness. We as an organization exist to provide you with great products and information to help you build a healthy body and achieve your fitness goals. Head over to flightsport.com, use promo code Casey Ryan Music at checkout for 10% off. Again, that's flightsport.com, promo code Casey Ryan Music at checkout for 10% off. Okay, so um, I'm, I've only actually, I'm, I'm actually only going to ask you one of the questions now because we're... Uh, we're about 42 minutes in, so it's kind of good timing, but, um, this, this is actually, yeah. oh yeah, dude, absolutely. Um, I don't, I don't, the thing is, is I don't necessarily want to put like a time limit on these things. I just, I kind of want to keep it more like digestible because you know, fucking people's like attention sure. span is like, I don't yeah. know, it's impossible to read so, nowadays, yeah. but getting the message out less more of like what we can talk about and what we enjoy personally, but yeah. more of like what's going to, yeah, absolutely. Uh, oh, the, the yeah. Belt. Yeah, you kind of kind of cut out there for a sec, but um, I'm not really I'm not it's sure not what he's important. okay. <laughs> um, yeah, it's done that a few times, so it, it's fine. Um, so I wanted to segue into purpose. So um, clearly, I think you're a person who's kind of harnessed his own ability to be individual, unique, and like just from like not only like the way you dress and the way you the way you speak and the things that you pursue in your life. So so how how is shaping like how? Ha- how have you been able to shape your own sense of that? And like, has it come mostly from your experiences in the psychedelic realm? Has it come from your pursuance of art or your pursuance of like business things or through pain? Or has it been a combination of everything? And is it like a continual learning process for you to kind of shape who you are? It is very fluid and continual. And honestly, I think it all comes from theft. Theft. Yep. I just, uh, I, I see something, I like it, I'll take it, and then I'll shave off the shit that I don't like. I'll keep everything that I do. And okay. I'll cast off all that other stuff, and then I just kind of move on. You know, it's like listening to podcasts and, and being around people and be like, oh, fuck yeah, I like that. I'm going to keep that. This other yeah. stuff, I don't know, maybe not so much. Yeah, you're like the existential, yeah. uh, fucking spiritual John Dillinger, dude. Literally, <laughs> you're a spiritual gangster, bro. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's just like, yeah. you know, it's like I'm not super original but i know what i like when i see it Mm -hmm. and then if i see somebody that is embodying something i could i could unpack that and like i said just like take that lego set and break it down and build it back up so like it might come across that it's my way but honestly it's just i'm standing on the shoulders of giants i feel like okay instead of like being an actual titan myself Mm -hmm. 
And also, I mean, I would, I would also argue that in doing so, you're, it's not coming from a place of you wanting it to be your own way more so than like you also want to provide that space for other people to, mm-hmm. to meet their own way. And I think that sometimes that can come across, especially in intimate relationships, it can come across as like you trying to dictate, like they, they might feel as though you're trying to dictate like what they're trying to feel or think or say. But I know, I, I, I know that like just speaking to you and like knowing you anyways that like, and even that I do, because I do that too. Anytime I've done that, it's not coming from that place. It's coming from like the, the desire for them to expand their consciousness too and expand like their own ability to understand things. Not saying that I have all the fucking answers or that you have all the answers, but just let's do this together, you know? And yeah. And, yeah. Mm-hmm. and it's like, you don't have to be at the top of the mountain to be like, hey, I just stepped on that rock. Maybe don't step on that rock, step right here. Mm-hmm. Or grab this branch, this branch is strong, this branch isn't. Like, without even having any knowledge of what, like, the pinnacle or the peak looks like, you can still offer guidance. And once I digested that, I was a lot more uh, boisterous and absolutely my word. And being able to tell people, be like, oh, I don't have to be the fucking Sifu up on the mountain with the crazy long mustache. So <laughs> just be, just like, me- levitating on top. To step ahead. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I don't touch the ground anymore. That's that's not for me. But, um, <laughs> I'm I'm above the ground, literally. I am over it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, so I guess. So just I mean, just touching on the sense of love. Then I mean, what would you say the biggest struggle is for you that you faced in maintaining a sense of love, or like, um, ha- have you struggled with loving yourself? Have you struggled with maintaining a sense of of longevity in love with other people? And do you have a fear of somebody maybe not loving you in that way too? Um, this was a a big point of contention in my most recent relationship is that I don't find longevity as a sign of success when it comes to love. Okay. So it's like when people are like, oh, my grandparents been together for fucking, you know, 60 years. Be like, well, women couldn't have fucking like bank accounts in like the fucking seventies. So yeah, Maybe your grandma wanted to fucking dip way back then and didn't have the means to. Not a very yeah, it's not it's lasted yeah. a long time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so um, so the longevity part, I try to look at the the value moment to moment, and and the lessons that I've learned, and then that it oh. of those was formative. And, um, yeah, so I just, I try to look back on things and and love and just be like, oh, that was fucking awesome. I learned how to do this. And without that person, I might not have learned that, even though they're not this big part of my life anymore. And I don't get to, you know, send them memes or have sex with them or have dinner or like laugh at shitty shit on Netflix or anything like that anymore. There's still value there. Yeah. But, um, love to the myself, like I said, is just that kind of radical forgiveness, I try to talk to myself, like, I think about, like, my little sister a lot, or, like, my little brother, like, I obviously adore them both, so it's just like, well, would I say this to them? No. So I'm not going to say it to myself. And to call it out when, like, my friends say shit like that, I'll look them dead in their face, and be like, hey, don't talk about my fucking friend that way. So anytime Mm. people say, like, negative stuff, and, you know, it's like, it's like us talking about, like, emotional and spiritual stuff, it's because we need it too. Yeah. You know, so so every time I, I tell somebody, I'm like, hey, don't talk about my friend that way. If they just said something shitty about themselves, it's because I know what that's like. I probably just did it a couple minutes ago. Yeah. And um, just kind of move move from there. So it's just constant work. But That's beautiful, man. And I, I also think that, yeah, I guess to summarize that as a whole, I think basically what you're you're saying is that, and something that I definitely wholeheartedly agree with is that, compassion should not just be extended to just the people that you love, but to yourself too. And Mm -hmm. the ability to be compassionate with yourself when you don't feel deserving of that compassion, it's fucking hard, man. It really is. Because I think, I mean, just like what you said, like what you'd say, like, don't talk about my friend that way. Like I talk to myself like that every fucking day, man. Like, and like rarely do, rarely do I allot myself the freedom to say, this was like, I feel good about this. That show that you came to uh, when I was up in Idaho, I mean, mm-hmm. that was an example of a moment where I allowed myself to feel really good about something. 
um, because it was like a beautiful moment, but like that it's, it's rare. So I, I'm actually learning just now in my life, like recently how to have that compassion for myself. And it's, it's very challenging. So I, I, I encourage anybody going through that to just kind of catch yourself in the moment when you do it and be mindful of it. And just, just like what you said, radical self-forgiveness, because at the end of the day, you're fallible, you're a human, you're going to fuck up, you're going to make mistakes, but it's how you, how you put your best foot forward after doing so to yourself and other people yeah. is like the most important thing. So absolutely. But yeah. Yeah. This is all really wholesome. Uh, we'll have to bring it back again and get kind of raunchy. Cause I was listening to some of your other shows and I was like, we can, Oh, for sure. People blush, I think. Oh, for sure, man. Uh, yeah. And, uh, actually, um, <laughs> I don't want people to get the wrong idea, oh dude, yeah, you're, you're, you're not gonna, you're fucking, you're for sure going to be on again, man. Um, let's get to some listener questions real quick and then we'll get you out of here. Absolutely. Okay, man. Cool. Oh, um, gosh, man. So, uh, if you guys want to email any questions, I've, I've got a lot to sort through, but you guys can email info.thestarvingartistpodcast at gmail.com. Again, that's info.thestarvingartistpodcast at gmail.com. Um, I picked some that were kind of related to, you know, who you are and like who I am. And I figured it might be kind of cool. Uh, Kristen out of Spokane, Washington. What's your, what's your favorite tattoo and why? Ooh, damn. I don't linger very long on that. Because yeah, because you're a tattoo artist. Like so I just done. was curious. Yeah. yeah, you like pat yourself on the back and then you're like, cool, what's the next one? But I did just recently do this like Hermione pinup where I took a picture of oh. Emma Watson and just kind of turned her back into Hermione because, like, I'm not Catholic and neither was my client, so we didn't want her to look like a little girl. <laughs> <laughs> hot but, Hermione. Uh, yeah, so hot Hermione. Dude, I fucking her loved Hermione, though, dude. I loved yeah. her. Yeah. I mean, anybody our age that says, like, they don't, be like, why are you lying, bro? Yeah, you fucking, like, yeah, you did. On. You, you did. Know, just, Everybody did. Come on. Come on. <laughs> come so, on. That one, that one recently was pretty good, and then I did like a uh, Hinata pinup because I'm a big uh, Naruto fan, and mm-hmm. so I got to do this like kind of make it look like a silk painting, but it's clearly like an anime character. And then I did a little tiny Naruto over her shoulder, and he's got like the anime nosebleed because she's got a titty out. So uh... <laughs> yeah, dude. Um, speaking of this, okay. First of all, for one thing, you're a very talented artist, and it's fucking bullshit oh, because yeah. every like. Okay, I don't know if you know this, but every musician wishes they could, like, paint or draw. I can't fucking draw shit, dude. So I, like, literally, I, I, I try to sit down sometimes and just, like, draw something, and I'm like, eh, mm-hmm. can't do it. Yeah, but, it's uh, just reps, man. Like, just reps, yeah. As much as you did, I'd, I'd be good. If you drew as much as I did, then it's yeah. like, yeah, you'd be I guess that, yeah. in. I guess that's true. But, uh, but anyways, what I was going to say too, man, um, feel free to send me some fucking art and like, or some maybe tattoo okay. ideas and I'll fucking post that shit on this podcast. Um, oh, cool. and shout you out. Um, okay. So Jordan out of Boston, Massachusetts, what's the best way to keep yourself Boston? What's the best way to keep yourself humble in the face of the temptation of the ego to drive you toward arrogance? Great fucking question, by the way. Ooh. Um, I think it comes down to like the people that you are surrounding yourself with. It's really easy to be humble if you surround yourself with fucking killers. Yeah, that's a great point. So, yeah, if you're the smartest motherfucker in a room, find another room. Dude, I love that. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. I think, yeah, the, the circle you keep is important. And um, mm-hmm. I also think being mindful of your own propensity for your ego to do that and like in this situation while it's happening for example like mm-hmm. just for me what happens like sometimes if I get done playing a show and, and like I have like people come up to me and be like dude that was fucking awesome and I'm just like in my head I'm like <laughs> just like pump me up dude um, yeah, because be, but that yeah. doesn't mean that you stop working yeah exactly so like what I what I try to do is like instead of instead of taking it as like taking it as like oh well I've just reached the point like I'm here like just being just literally saying thank you. I appreciate it because I do. And yeah, being absolutely. able to, yeah, being able to always still stay hungry. I think that like some people think that they reach a certain point and, or they reach a certain level, like whether it's like a physical, like whether you put in the work in like to fitness or your mind or your career or whatever, like just yeah. n- n- not being satisfied in content and comfort, like maybe recognizing and being proud of yourself, but also understanding that like life oh, is sure. the journey and not the destination yeah, necessarily. It's a lease. 
Yeah, exactly, yeah. 100%. You don't get to keep those fucking keys. I think that was Dwayne motherfucking Johnson said that. Yeah. Uh, the whole, like, you know, rent is due every day. Yeah, yeah. And so it's like, so just pay up every day. Yeah. And that'll keep you humble because you always got shit to do. You just you don't give. Get to do the whole give. Thanos shit where you look over the galaxy and you just snapped away half of it and be like, oh, no, you don't <laughs> yeah. get that. Get to work. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Because that's the point of life. Jordan out of Boston. Great question, but yeah, just yeah, thank you, Jordan. work. Last question. Um, Dara out of Tucson, Arizona. The world needs creatives and artists now more than ever. What is your goal with music and the art you make and how and how do you think it can affect global change? Um, conceptualizing that into like how how is how has art helped you conceptualize like how it can help the world as a whole? Just art cool. tattoo. Well, yeah. I'd, like, I'd like to hear your answer too, but I think art uh, <clears throat> transcends just borders and language and just like it it doesn't matter who you are or, or where you're from some piece of art will speak to you mm-hmm. i didn't really get that for like a long time where you hear about these paintings with, with these like extravagant fucking price tags and soon and, and stuff and it's just like i didn't really ever get it until i saw a piece that almost made me cry and i was wow. like if i had fucking 16 grand in my pocket i was like that statue would have gone home with me because I could have looked at that and I could have been impacted by that so much. So I think that it's just exposing, trying to get your own specific art out there because you don't know who it's going to have that effect on and Mm -hmm. who's going to be like, who's going to see that and just be floored by it. And then, Mm -hmm. you know, also have the potential to make a bunch of money, which is pretty cool. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It's a (laughs) win-win. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, cause it's like, yeah, you could just like bring that, emotion and joy into somebody's home or somebody's garden or wherever they end up putting the art mm-hmm. that, that you make. That's amazing, man. That, that's a great answer. And I, and I think mine's very similar in the semblance of music too, is like my only goal with music and like how I, I agree with you as far as it transcending borders, I think music, and I would argue too, like even, well, maybe not tattoos cause there's still a little bit of stigma around that, but music and art in general is the one thing I think that everybody loves. You know, like mm-hmm. I've met a couple people that like when I ask them like, oh, what kind of music I like? They're like, I just don't really listen to music. I'm like, huh? Fucking liar. I'm like, yeah. I'm like, who are you? Like, I don't know. But um, I guess to answer the question further, I think that it can affect global change and it can make a difference by just bringing people together. And like, mm-hmm. like, because if you go to a concert or you go to a tattoo shop, there, there's going to be anywhere from there from the the conservative guy who wants to get a fucking American flag tattooed on him to, Mm -hmm. to the girl who has a hundred tattoos. who just wants to get covered in them, you know? So there's like, there's, Mm -hmm. it's, it transcends boundaries, but it also transcends the differences among people and it can bring people Mm -hmm. together in the sense for the common purpose of just enjoying it for what it is. So that's kind of like what my goal is. I just want to continue to be able to do that. And just like you said, you know, if I can make money doing that too, I mean, that's great, you know? So yeah. 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 So where, so, Hey man, uh, so real quick, so where can people find you? I mean, what do you got going on? What's new? I mean, um, mostly on the gram. Okay. At Wolf's intent, on, right? Yep. Wolf's intent. And then, uh, the tattoo page for the art is just my name, Jake, followed by C O T W. That's okay. for call of the wild. That's yes. where I work. Yes. And, um, yeah, those two will just kind of springboard you into most of the aspects of my life and all the other stuff that I'm involved with. So Absolutely, man. Well, dude, thank you so much, dude. I really yeah, fucking you. appreciate your time. I want to have you on again, definitely. And uh, dude, yeah, I'm, I'm glad we did this, man. We've been talking about it for a while, so I appreciate you, dude. So, oh, did I lose you? Hello. Appreciate you as well, man. All right, man. Sorry, yeah, we're kind of, audio is kind of cutting out again. I don't know what's going on, but anyways, that's it, everybody. Thank you guys so much. Bye. All right, later, brother. See you, man. Me and it's following me. The past it is bleeding me out. Everything I've kept up inside of me.